Hello and welcome back to the third installment of Netflix Sandman. If you missed any of the previous installments, I have attached links to those down below. With all of that out of way, let us begin and thank you for watching. Episode 3, Dream a Little Dream of Me A car pulls up to a back alley of a club. Out steps Clara, the impossible girl. She walks into the club, and sees a closed door with bright lights emanating from the gaps. Let me stop here for a moment. This is Joanna Constantine. A stand-in for John Constantine, but due to copyrights, they cannot use him by name. John is supposed to be a descendant of Lady Joanna Constantine, who is not this version of Joanna Constantine. She is simply the gender-swapped version of John, and that is fine, so far. However, who is in charge of wardrobe? Is this the best they could come up with for her look? Yes, I know it is Jenna Coleman from Doctor Who. She was the companion right at the time Doctor Who went full work. That is a strange coincidence, is it not? I stopped watching Doctor Who during this time, but I have seen a few episodes here and there, and the only thing I remember about her, regardless of the situation, was she always had a cute smirk on her face. Encounters Hostile Aliens Cute Smirk Unexpected World Event Cute Smirk Facing Imminent Death Cute Smirk Anyway, she does not look striking or memorable. She does not look like a badass. She looks forgettable. Honestly, was that the look they were going for? Okay. Let us resume. As she approaches slowly and closer, a little girl, Astra, calls to her from behind telling her they have to leave. Anyway, Joanna asks her what has happened, and Astra tells Joanna that it was her father, and it was an accident, like when her mother died. Stop. Being that Astra is half black, and the father is the one that caused this dilemma, what do you think the chances are that the white half of her, is the father? That's right. 100%. Fucking hell. The father is passed out over some magical writing on the floor, and Joanna calls him to see if he is awake. Let me stop again. I am not a Brit, but I do know that John Constantine is supposed to be from Liverpool and I know that Liverpudlians speak with a Scouse accent. The girl sounds Scouse. The father sounds Scouse. Is the impossible girl trying to speak in a Scouse accent? Listen for yourself. Oi, Logue. Bit of fun. Summoning demons for fun. Who's we? Where are the others? Did that sound Scouse? Here is a comparison. Are you fucking joking? I'm sorry, that was a Bolton accent. Oh, fuck you now, what's that, Nick? Well, like, don't start changing fucking Perhaps she is only trying to do a Cockney accent like Matt Ryan. Here is a comparison just for context. Oh. Hey, I told you not to do that, Orchid. Use a bloody door. So is any of this a deal breaker? No. Which leads to the question, of all the people they could have cast, this was the person they felt was the best for the part. That is obviously not true. We have only just started the episode, and I already know she was casted due to wokeness or cronyism. Anyway, back to the episode. Joanna finds a book of satanic rituals and wakes up the dad with it. She asked what did he do and he replies they were just having a bit of fun. She asks, where are the others, and he says they're still inside and she shouldn't go in there. But apparently Joanna is feeling altruistic, whereas John Constantine is the constant cynic, and she says somebody has to clean up his mess. Why does she volunteer? Who knows? Astra tells Joanna, that she's coming with her. Stop again. What is the daughter doing there in the first place? Her deadbeat dad is summoning demons at a club for kicks, and he brings his daughter along? Why? Oh you might say, maybe she got there after the fact. Then how does she know it was an accident, unless daddy told her? Who knows, or better yet, the showrunners would say, who cares? Anyway, Joanna tells her to stay here with her dad. She approaches the door, and we get a Dutch angle view as whatever is inside is ominous and scary. She goes to the door and opens it, and it is hard to pick up, but girl boss mode is activated, and we get a bright light illuminating her unfazed face, and she's sucked into the room. Suddenly, she wakes up in a cabbie in London. She says her night is just getting started, and steps out of the cabbie. As the cabbie pulls away, an old lady is standing behind her and calls to her. Joanna goes to talk to Mad Hetty, and she tells Joanna that he's coming. He who, Joanna asks, and Hetty tells her an heiress, Morpheus, the Sandman, and he wants his sand. Joanna doesn't care, or has any interest at all, and why would she, but tells Hetty she's got work to do. Morpheus appears in front of Joanna and calls to her. She asks if they've met, and he just says they have business together. She tells him to get in line, and walks off. 
Of course, as it has been thoroughly established that this is a woke show, and a white male must always take a back seat to a female or person of color regardless of how pissed off he looks, or out of character they have to be. Even the alpha of alpha males must, and will always take a back seat in deference to wokeness. Joanna goes into the cathedral, and is met by the priest. Sorry. Priestess. Stop again. Forgive me for all of these pauses, but this episode is laden with questionable moments. I am not Catholic, but I know she is wearing a Catholic priest's robe and collar. Even I know that women cannot become priests and men cannot become nuns. And to go a step further, I have never seen, or met an Indian Catholic. Not to say it is not possible. Perhaps there are some in England. It is not a big deal, but not very realistic either. But I guess since the show is overtly woke, somebody said, why should they be restricted to any realism at all? Anyway, her priestess, and Joanna chat as to why she was called. The priestess needs Joanna to perform an exorcism as she believes the princess is possessed, and is demanding to be wed to some rubbish football player. Joanna does not want to do it because it involves the royal family, and it is too much to answer for if the situation turns tits up. Joanna hears some screaming in the distance, and asks if that was her, and the priestess mentions that she can smell the sulfur as well, so Joanna, altruistic as a Constantine does, decides to do it. She tells the priestess to give her her robes, and Joanna takes her place as the priestess performing the wedding ceremony. The groom-to-be is a beta male, while the princess clearly took etiquette lessons from Meghan Markle, but I digress. After the two give their I do's, Joanna tells them to repeat after her as she spouts phrases in Latin. As she continues, the groom begins to have stomach pains until he doubles over. Joanna turns her attention over to him, and continues chanting in Latin, when a demon's arms reach out from his mouth and tears him open. The real priestess scurries the princess away from them as Joanna continues chanting in Latin. The demon tells her to shut up, and she says to tell her his name and she'll stop. The demon says why as he can make her stop, when Morpheus appears and says his name is Agaliath. Agaliath, greets Morpheus and says he almost did not recognize him without his helm and asks him where it is. Morpheus tells him it is probably in hell, and Agaliath asks him which demon has it? He offers a bargain to him, the name of the demon for the princess. But Joanna proceeds with the exorcism. Agaliath pleads to Morpheus, he tell him the demon's name if he would just stop Joanna from sending him back, but Joanna doesn't care and continues. The demon is sent back, and Morpheus is upset not gaining the information he needed, but Joanna is smugly unbothered. Let's stop here for a second. For reference, none of this is from the source material. This is all work rubbish. The female person of color priestess, the beta male groom-to-be, the bitchy princess, and the Caribbean demon. It was all fabricated to allow Joanna to activate girl boss mode, and display her character. Displaying her character is a good thing. This showing, rather than telling. However, what did we learn from her? She is competent and confident. Yet, being that this is a work show, these attributes are obvious, so showing this is redundant. She is smug, standoffish, and last, but not least, smirky. Again, nothing new for a woman in a work show. She does display attributes related to John Constantine, but none of the anguish and despair the real John Constantine must cope with on a daily basis. Also, of all the exorcisms I have seen from other shows and movies, this is by far the easiest, and the cleanest one ever done. It looks absolutely effortless. There is no fear, no strenuous effort, and no exhaustion after performing the task. The whole thing looks as hard as brewing a cuppa as it looks more of a hassle, than a task, or more of a task, than a job. Meanwhile, Back in Buffalo, New York, Ethel is still talking to John. She tries to warn him that Morpheus is back, and is coming for his ruby, but John does not believe her as she has lied to him all his life including who his father was. John finds out that he was the son of Roderick Burgess, and Ethel tells him that he wanted to have him aborted. John believes her, and tells her if she wants the ruby, then she confesses the truth. Back in London, Joanna wraps up her dealings with the priestess, while Mad Hetty talks to Morpheus in the distance. Joanna and Morpheus have a conversation, and he explains to her that he is looking for his pouch of sand. She remembers it, but had no idea it was his, and says she was never able to use it as she could not even get the pouch open. He asks where it is, and she says it could be anywhere, but he says they must find it for the sake of humanity. Reluctantly, she agrees but not till morning. Morpheus protests, and says they should begin now, but she says she works alone, and she does not want him and his friend following her all around. He questions her, what friend? And asks if that is his raven. They look over at a bench, and a raven is perched looking at them. Morpheus approaches it and asks what is its name. 
the raven says Matthew, let's stop again. Seriously, they could not find any other actor to voice Matthew other than Remy the Rat. I do not think the voice fits at all. Never ever did I read the comic, and imagine the voice of Matthew was a high-pitched nasally voiced person. Being that Mark Hamill did the voice of Merv Pumpkinhead, why didn't they ask him? I know it is a minor quibble, but it is another example of work casting at the detriment of realism. Just for comparison's sake, the audible version of Matthew is voiced by Andy Serkis. Are the differences not an obvious confirmation of creative choices guided by a woke agenda? Anyway, Morpheus tells Matthew, that he told Lucian he does not need the assistance of a raven. During their brief conversation, Joanna leaves in a flash. And just like that, she's gone. Matthew says this is why he needs a raven, and Morpheus reiterates he does not need his help, and orders him back to the dreaming. Back in Buffalo, Ethel is telling John her life story. She tells him that she traded the items for the amulet of protection. John says the ruby will not do anybody any good as he has altered it, and only he could use it, but Ethel does not care as she does not want to use it, but return it to Morpheus. John balks at the idea not wanting to give up the power the ruby has, and keeping it for themselves to start anew. Back in London, Matthew lands next to Morpheus disobeying him once again. He says Lucian won't allow his return, and Morpheus states she is not his master. He is. They talk about Jessa May, and then realize that if Joanna is asleep, Morpheus can find her in her dreams. Let's pause it here for a moment. None of this dialogue is source material. Matthew is not introduced yet in the comic, and by injecting him into the story with this dialogue once again, weakens the character of Morpheus. The white boss man needs assistance from Matthew, whose loyalty does not reside with the Lord of Dreams, but with a black female underling and usurper, Lucian. Such insolence. And all done by a deviation of the source material, which begs the question. Why? And the answer is as clear as an azure sky. It is only the third episode, and we have already detailed so many deviations in favor of the woke narrative. I assume the showrunners believe the viewers are too stupid to pick up on a subtle and nuanced story, or more likely, they don't care, and want to just shove the overt woke narrative down our throats. Anyway, Morpheus appears in her dream of the nightclub. He approaches a door with flicking light on the bottom. He sees Joanna chanting in Latin holding back a demon from a fiery portal when Astra appears calling to Joanna. Just a note, the kids in this show make really stupid choices devoid of any common sense whatsoever, and it is these stupid choices they make that drives the story along. She tells her to go back, but the demon reaches a flaming tentacle and grabs her leg to pull her in. Joanna grabs Astra and holds onto her as the demon continues to pull her in. She continues chanting in Latin until the fiery portal closes, and Joanna holds the severed hand of Astra. Let me stop here for a moment. What makes her run in there? She was told to stay with her dad, and I'm pretty sure she knows what her dad was doing in there. So the point I am making is, if a kid goes to a beach, and sees a sign that says no swimming, shark-infested waters, and the kid sees dorsal fins in the water, and the kid goes swimming anyway, and gets eaten, should we still feel sorry for the kid? In general, no kid is that stupid, yet this is the contrived emotion we're supposed to have. Oh wait you say. It is not us the viewers, that are supposed to feel bad, but Joanna. This is to give her emotional baggage for her character. True. Yet if this was John Constantine, he would have just told the guy to piss off, and he would have never shown up, and Astra would not be dead. Yet Joanna clearly said, wait here. Joanna did her due diligence before her uncharacteristic act of altruism. Even when the stupid kid ran in, she still did everything she could to keep her safe. So, a bad memory? Yes. A guilty conscience? No. As they say, stupid is as stupid does. And it was the kid's stupidity that did her in. Not Joanna's inaction. At this point, some of you will think I'm some heartless sod, for feeling nothing at the demise of a child. Spare me. I know this is fiction, and trying to garner emotional points with ridiculous story contrivances is, and always will be cheap. Do you think Neil Gaiman would write something so cheap and contrived? Hell no. She then wakes from her nightmare, rather calmly in my opinion, to see Morpheus is in her room. He tells her she was dreaming, but it wasn't a dream. It was a memory and he could make it go away. They go to her office, and begin searching for the pouch. As they look, they banter about how he lost it in the first place, and she comes to the conclusion that, Morpheus was imprisoned by Roderick Burgess for all those years. Morpheus pulls a photo tag from a desk, and asks if this was Joanna. She says yeah, and asks if she looks all that different because she was younger. He says no, she looks different because she looks happy. Then Joanna realizes where his pouch is. Back in Buffalo, 
Ethel and John have come to terms with their relationship. John asks Ethel to bring the ruby to him, and Ethel declines to do so knowing how dangerous it is in John's hands. He tells her she can protect them both with it, but she does not need protection because she has the amulet. She pleads to him that all she wants to do is protect him, and finally she removes the amulet and gives it to John. Back in London, Morpheus and Joanna go to Rachel's flat. We find out that Rachel is an ex-girlfriend of Joanna, and they live together for a short time until Joanna moved out suddenly. They talk about love, and how it never ends well, and she tells Morpheus to wait outside punctuating it with some girl boss attitude. As this is a woke show, the white male must stand there and take it. No questions asked. Joanna goes up and talks to race swapped character number four, Rachel. She answers the door, and lets Joanna grovel a bit until she invites her in. Matthew talks to Morpheus telling him that humans are not to be trusted, and the devious things he would do. Up in the flat, Joanna is making out with Rachel, and Rachel tells Joanna that she still owes her a huge apology. She tells her how scared she was when she did not come home that night, and she called all of her acquaintances to find out where she was. She says all of her exes told her to just forget about her, as she is a selfish person that ruins everything as Rachel turns to sand. Morpheus enters, and calls out to Joanna to find her sleeping. He tells her it was the sand. Let's stop it here. In the comic, being at Rachel's is the majority of the comic. It shows how the sand has affected the house and the inhabitants with a melding of the waking world with the dreaming. It is Morpheus that guides John Constantine through the chaos, and it is Morpheus that keeps John from getting caught up in the magic of the sand. I know translating this part of the comic into the show would require a lot of special effects to be done, so I understand the omission on those grounds, but that's not to say an abridged version could not be done. However, we also get the omissions of Morpheus showing he is the lord and master of his realm, being able to decipher what is dream, and what is reality. In my humble opinion, it is because of the latter is why this segment was omitted. Showing that the white male boss man as a representation of the patriarchy, guiding and preventing any harm to come to Joanna would not fit the woke narrative. Once again, the source material is intentionally sacrificed in order to preserve the facade of wokeism. They find Rachel in the bedroom wasting away in bed addicted to the sand. Morpheus takes his pouch and says they can leave now, but Joanna protests saying they can't just leave her like this. She gives him a girl boss lecture, and as a woke show would do, the white male must stand there and taking it like a bitch. Just for a moment, what would a proper alpha male say in this situation? Okay, fuck you, how's that? Anyway, she tells her to wait outside, and sprinkles some sand to give her a final pleasant dream before she passes on. Back in Buffalo, John is afraid to get close to Ethel as she tries to give the amulet to John. She pleads with him that she is only trying to protect him. John finally accepts the amulet, and they hug in reconciliation. Ethel apologizes for being a bad mother, and when John looks at her, he sees she has aged immensely. He asks her to take it back, but she tells him it is too late as she ages rapidly before his eyes. He calls the guards for help, but Ethel passes away from old age. A guard comes into the room, and asks what did he do to her, and pulls a gun on him. He says he has done nothing. The guard calls for backup, and John asks the guard to just let him go, and the guard warns him that he will shoot. John steps toward the guard, and the guard shoots only to die. John leaves the room, and picks up the guard's keys. Two guards appear in the elevator pointing guns at him, and when they shoot, they both die. John calmly leaves the hospital, and walks out the front door only wearing PJs, and nobody says anything. Let me stop it right here. This place has guards. Armed guards. Not just with pistols, but with assault rifles. So he just stroll out of the lobby with only his PJs, and nobody stops him without any alerts or alarms. Honestly, what is this place? Why is it so poorly run? Why is the security so arbitrary? This is absolutely atrocious writing. Perhaps John kills everybody off screen, but look at this. What are those people doing in the background? Not a care in the world. No monitoring. No alerts. No nothing. Just a casual stroll out of the facility. Fucking hell. Outside, the Corinthian greets John, and gives him his coat to wear, and tells him he just wants him to get where he is going, and the two part ways. Back in London, Morpheus tells Joanna that Rachel passed peacefully. Matthew flies next to them, and she asks what its name is. Morpheus says it is Matthew, and she cuts him off telling Matthew to look after him. As if the white male immortal, that has lived since the dawn of time, requires the constant vigil and aid from his underlings, or else he will cease to exist or something. As Joanna leaves, Morpheus calls out to her, and tells her that the bad memory will cease to haunt her dreams. Let me stop here for a moment to point out something. 
Watch this sequence. Constantine! That nightmare won't trouble you anymore. Now here is the same scene in the comic. It reads, well, I, I don't like to ask for favors. If they don't owe me something. Morpheus replies, what are you asking, John Constantine? Ever since Newcastle I've been having these nightmares, bad ones. Most nights and, I wondered if you could. Morpheus replies, I understand. Very well. Do you see the difference? Do you see how the end result is the same, but the characterizations are completely reversed? With Joanna not asking him for a favor, the showrunners are displaying her activating girl boss mode once again, and Morpheus is the one that does her a favor. Seems fair, but comic book Morpheus is stoic and acts not out of kindness, but out of necessity. It is not necessary for him to end John Constantine's bad dreams. He does so, because he was asked, and he aided him in his recovery of his pouch. It is these kinds of minor changes throughout the show that alters the characters drastically, and yet the overall story is relatively the same. One may call that clever, but I would label it sneaky, much to the detriment of the real story. Morpheus and Matthew have a conversation and Matthew is insolent, as that is acceptable, since this is a work show and he's addressing a white male. He then tells Matthew they're going to retrieve his helm in hell. This concludes episode 3, review time. I have to start from the beginning. This was a rubbish episode from start to finish, as I am sure you have gathered from all of the pauses in the review. The introduction of Joanna Constantine was rubbish. The poor casting. The uninspiring wardrobe. The rubbish scouse or cockney accent. The priestess and the effortless exorcism. The one good thing was the total absence of Lucian, but then we got Matthew, who is just as insolent and annoying making him Lucian by proxy. Finally the incessant, and overt girl boss moments are cringier than being forced to drink a cup of your own piss. Let us look at Matthew in this episode. Where did he come from? The dreaming, but he was not created by Morpheus. He does not know who he was, so how did he get created? Lucian? Lucian created Matthew. What a travesty. Apparently, just being the librarian of the dreaming, she can also create dreams on her own. Also, Morpheus did not ask for his assistance, and told Lucian directly, he does not need a raven. Was he right, or was she right? Did Matthew do anything that protected him, or did he just get in his way? He does nothing useful in the episode. Also, when Morpheus tells him to go back to the dreaming, Matthew replies the boss lady will not allow him back. The boss lady? Matthew obeys her, but he does not obey his lord and master's orders. The blatant insolence coming from him to his lord and master deserves Morpheus to simply uncreate him right on the spot. How many people employ such insolent employees and never sack them? You do not see these kinds of business owners, because these owners had their businesses go under. So let's assign a grade to the episode. Without the source material, I will stretch it to a 5. Knowing the source material, it is a 2. The show just continues to diminish Morpheus as a character, and I do not see anything that will change that path. This concludes the review of episode 3. As always, many thanks for watching, and I hope to see you in the next installment.